of the Arab Uprising by Professor Ebni Sinanovic, hosted by the Turkish Student Association and co-sponsored by the Department of Middle Eastern Studies, the Muslim Student Association, and the Graduate Student Organization. Tonight's event is just one amongst the multitude of events that the TSA holds each semester. In addition to gracing us with tonight's original Turkish food, which is pizza and soda, um, the Turkish Student Association participates in a variety of campus-wide events such as cultures in the quad. Each semester, the TSA holds a tea and coffee night and movie nights showing feature Turkish films subtitled in English, um, Turkish table and welcome graduation picnics and Turkish food parties with foods such as chikhefte, not pizza. For those that would like to have more information on TSA activities, the Turkish Student Association publishes a newsletter each semester. I believe that on the past the newsletters right now, so they're called Orange Turkey. You can pick them up at the refreshment table as you go out. Um, or you can join the TSA on Facebook or follow them on Orgsyn. Now that I've done this publicity plug, I will introduce our guest lecturer for the evening, Professor Edmund Sinanovic. Um, Professor Sinanovic is originally from Bosnia and Herzegovina, a small country in Eastern Europe. Having formerly taught the United States Naval Academy in Maryland, he is now the Director of Research and Academic Programs at the International Institute for Islamic Thought. He received a BA in Islamic Studies and a BA in Political Science, both from the International Islamic University of Malaysia. He then received an MA in Islamic Civilization from the International Institute of Islamic Thought and Civilization in Kuala Lumpur, where he wrote a master's thesis on the majority principle in Islamic legal and political thought. He obtained an MA in political science from my very own alma mater, Maxwell, that's why we're here. His doctoral dissertation examined the role of religious ideas in contemporary Islamic revival in Malaysia. In fact, I believe he just came back from Malaysia. Please join us in welcoming Dr. Edmund Sinanovic to the stage. back and I don't know why half of you are sitting so far away you want to test the strength of my vocal cords I guess so it would be perhaps easier if you came down a little bit closer I don't think there is a microphone here right so but I hope you can hear me um, incidentally it's not the first time I'm, I'm lecturing on this stage I, more than 10 years ago, I was a part of a teaching team, the course, Maxwell course, it's Max 132 called Global Community, and we used to hold our lectures here, and um, each one of us, each member of the team would deliver a few lectures, so I've already been here, I can't say done that, but, um, and I'm especially privileged that one of my professors is here today. Of course, I have to single him out, Professor Alf Ketchum, who is an institution here at Maxwell School, has been around for more than 50, almost 60 years now, right? Was it? And uh, teaches one of the absolutely best courses, not only here at Syracuse, but I think anywhere at any university, Foundations of American Political Thought. And if you haven't, if you're a student here and haven't taken that course, no matter what you study, if you study oceanography, if you study maritime life, you should take this class. It is, it is, an, it is an outstanding class, and I'm privileged that he is here today with us and to see him again, as well as seeing all of you. And I would like to thank Turkish Student Association and everybody else who uh, co-sponsored and, and supported this event to to make it happen. And I thank all of you for coming. Now. Having said all that, let me now turn to the topic, which is political Islam after the Arab Spring. This topic is very broad, of course, <coughs> and it will be impossible to encapsulate everything that's been happening with political Islam since the onset of what is called the Arab Spring or the Arab uprisings. In addition, political Islam is such a complex and multifaceted phenomenon that we need to begin by saying that it is neither monolithic nor unison. It is a polyphonic, or even better, a cacophonic trend, with multiple players, many of whom engage in their own game and are opposed to other Islamist actors. So we're not talking about 
one specific actor, or we're not talking about a monolith. We're talking here about diversity of political actors, which makes our analysis of that phenomenon both more interesting but also more difficult. Because you're not talking about one thing, you're talking about many sub-phenomena under this umbrella that is called political Islam. And I should also mention here that my remarks in this lecture will primarily be concerning Sunni Islamist actors. I'm not going to talk about the Shia Islamist actors. So Hezbollah or the Iranian political institution or the Shia in Bahrain are not going to be covered here. So let me just briefly walk you, and I'm not going to do much of this chronology because I will assume that most of you know what happened. And I don't think lecture would be interesting if I would just tell you what happened in the last three years. But I'm just going to walk you through it quickly, and then I'm going to turn to analysis. So political Islamists were victorious in early days after the uprisings, but have since fallen on hard times and are fighting for survival in several Middle Eastern countries. Yet, if experience can teach us anything, it is that Islamists are at their best when they are faced with oppression. They like the narrative of being al-Musta'afun. That is to say, the oppressed. In, in Farisi, they would say al musta'afun to, uh, to feel this notion of being oppressed, because it has a strong echoes in Islamic history, and that seems to bring uh, additional strength to their, to their cause. They have survived enormous challenges to their existence in the past, and there is great likelihood that they will do so in future. This leads me to my thesis statement for this evening's lecture, which is, while the Islamists will most likely, almost certainly, survive current challenges, they will emerge from them in a different form. Their ideas will continue to evolve. And toward the end of this lecture, I will indicate some areas in which such evolution may be taking place already. But I will start with an observation. Instead of walking you through the chronology, I want to mention something that would, I think, be especially of interest for political scientists and social scientists among you. If we look at regime types in the Middle East prior to the uprisings, we'd find that it was not oil producing single party republics that have proven to be most unstable. Non oil producing single party republics that have proven to be most unstable, namely Egypt, Syria, and Tunisia. Monarchies, whether oil or not oil producing, and democracies or democratizing regimes or even pseudo democracies that would include countries like Israel, Turkey, Lebanon, Iraq, and Iran have so far been able to withstand pressures. So if you do this regime typology, if you will, you look at monarchies, whether they are oil or non-oil producing, they seem to have survived the uprisings. If you look at uh, democracies, it's the same. It is single party, non-oil producing republics that have been most affected by this. So if you're a political scientist, you must think there's something there. But I'm not gonna make my lecture about it. I'm just gonna make this observation and leave that to the rest of you to think what does that mean. It is also interesting to know that most of the theorizing by the Sunni Islamists took place in these three non-oil producing single party republics. If you look at the main texts that are used by political Islamists, they are disproportionately produced in Egypt, Tunisia, and Syria. You won't find much Islam Islamist political thinking coming out of Libya. And if you look at the Gulf countries, yeah, you can talk about the Salafis but not about the kind of other type of Islamists producing much of the work in, in those countries. So it is interesting that you have this match, that the countries that seem to be uh, very oppressive seem to produce the bulk of Islamist thinking and have in return also been most unstable. Because of this theorizing that took place among Sunni Islamists, they were at least theoretically best prepared to engage with democratic and pluralistic thought. Theoretically. In practice, it turned out to be a little bit different. Because it is one thing to theorize about democracy, it's another to start practicing it. Um, what happened in Tunisia and Egypt is known by now. Islamists won plurality in Tunisia, about 41% of seats in the parliament. 
and about three-quarter majority in Egypt combined between the Freedom and Justice Party, which was a political party of the Muslim Brothers, and the largest Salafi party, which is a newer party and, uh, in Egypt. Combined, they controlled almost three-quarter of the parliament after those first elections, after the, uh, the fall of the Mubarak regime. In both countries, they have been forced to withdraw from the government since, but under a very different set of circumstances. In Syria, Islamists of various kinds formed the core of the opposition to al-Assad's regime. In Libya, Islamists also emerged as important power brokers in the government. Oil-rich Arab monarchies, on the other hand, have since banned the brothers. I, I, I use the brothers for the Muslim brothers instead of the brotherhood because uh, anyone who speaks Arabic here would know that that is a more proper translation of the Arabic al Muslim the Muslim brothers. Otherwise, Muslim brothers would be al khuwa al So it's, uh, it's, it, I'm just mentioning this because the brotherhood has become such a prevalent term and it's really a mistranslation from Arabic. So uh, when I use the word the brothers, I'm, I'm referring to the Muslim brothers. Um, it seems that today only Qatar and Turkey are the only two countries supporting of the Islamist agenda in the region. The events of the last four years have exposed a major characteristic, maybe a flaw, within the brother -inspired, brotherhood inspired parties and movements. And that is they are inherently evolutionary and not revolutionary. The brothers type movements and parties, be they in Egypt, in Tunisia, and other place, they believe in what they call tadrij, which is evolutionary gradual change. And so when they were met with a revolutionary moment after the uprisings, there was a mismatch. Their ideology simply did not allow for revolutionary change. And that explains many of the choices that they made, or that they made when they were in power in Egypt. And that also explains why the Tunisian Islamists were ready to compromise and reach the solution that they did in Tunisia as well. So their main characteristic is really conservatism. They are not revolution oriented. As such, they prefer accommodation over confrontation, compromise over principal stance. In short, there was a mismatch between the demands of the moment and their ideology. They were never going to be able to satisfy demands that were rooted in the need for radical change in their own society. It simply is not in their DNA. Another observation related to US policies in order here, and this is more of a footnote or a margin, uh, marginal remark, and that is where the US had relatively good relations, the old regimes was more willing to give in. Think of Tunisia and Egypt relatively good relation with the United States when the uprising was happening, there was some signal sent, the regime stepped down. Conversely, where the US relations were strained or non-existent, Libya or Syria, the regime was more likely to dig in and to engage in a protracted battle with the opposition. This is a thesis. It fits, you know, first observation seemed to be okay but for, the, for those of you who are political scientists, it's perhaps something you can examine in a paper or a dissertation or something like that. Uh, so it seems that America's declining role in the region made, made the uprisings more likely. And more could be said about the US role, but that is not the main topic here. I'm putting it as a footnote to understand differences in, in the outcomes. So as I already stated, I will not go into chronology or what happened immediately after the uprising up until now. This history is relatively well known, even though interpretations may vary widely, and some would say wildly. In the next few minutes, I propose to analyze what happened with and to the Islamists. The case of the Muslim brothers in Egypt shows a great deal of conceptual confusion among the brothers on many different levels. One could argue that such lack of clarity is to be expected due to the fact that nobody other than the previous regime had much political experience. I mean, nobody in, in, in Egypt or in Tunisia had much political experience unless you were associated with the regime. So once you're put in a position of power, what do you do? It's easy to be in opposition and criticize, but once you are asked to run a ministry, to run a police force, 
to, to do all these kind of things and you are totally unprepared, it, it's, it becomes difficult. It would also be said, on the other hand, that the Muslim brothers and many similar parties and movements had a lot of time on their, on their hand to plan for such exigencies. That is to say, maybe they were unprepared in terms of practical knowledge, but they had a lot of time on their hands, several decades, to think about what if you ever come to power, what should we do? And, and that would require the kind of thinking that would go beyond just oh, we want an Islamic state with the Sharia and this and that. What, what would you do in terms of agriculture? How would you solve the problem of, I don't know, lack of fertilizers in, in agricultural areas? I mean, these are the kind of things people don't like to think about. But these things make or break governments, as we know. One such problem area for the Muslim Brothers was in dealing with the state. On the one hand, there was a lack of understanding how to deal with the deep state and how to transform it. On the other, the Muslim Brothers' concept of the Islamic State was unclear. What kind of a state did the Muslim Brothers and the related parties and movements want? Do they want an Islamic State? And what does that mean? Do they want a civil state, if such a state exists? Uh, I don't know if, and, and, and this is interesting because in Arabic political discourse, you hear this a lot, right? Civil state. And if you look at political science literature, at least in the West, I don't think there is such typology. What is the civil state? What, what does that mean? Or when they say a civil state with an Islamic reference. That is what they would say. But what does that really mean? Nobody really knows. So they were unclear what they want on the one hand. On the other, when they faced the state that already existed, they didn't know how to deal with it was such a deep state, so deeply entrenched, such vested interests, and they really had no game plan for that. Another problem is within the area of economics. For all the talk about Islamic economics, banking, and finance, the Muslim Brothers simply bought into the neoliberal economic model. And we see that in Turkey, even, right, among the AKP. In the eyes of many Egyptians, it was precisely the neoliberal model that created huge inequalities and prevented many ordinary Egyptians from sharing in countries wealth. So if the Muslim brothers said we're going to have more of the same, the ordinary people in Egypt are going to say, well, we had a revolution in order to not have more of the same. So that was another problem. And so the Muslim brothers' acceptance of this neoliberal economic model was a continuation of the status quo, which was simply unacceptable to many Egyptians. Yet another set of problems was caused by the Muslim Brothers' internal inconsistencies. If you were to follow the statements, political programs of the Muslim Brothers after the uprisings, you would really be confused as to what they really want. Because you sometimes would get mixed and contradictory messages from different parts of the Muslim Brothers. So, that uh, the Guidance Bureau, Mektab al would say one thing. The FJP, the political party, would say something else. The presidency would issue a statement that would contradict what these other two are saying. Um, and so it, it was unclear. In other words, the Muslim Brothers become, became so deeply institutionalized, democratic, that, and uh, so deeply institutionalized, that they really did not speak with one voice. They spoke with many voices, and that confused a lot of people. If there is one lesson they should learn from this experience is that political and religious work need to be separated. This is precisely what the Turkish Islamists did, and when they did that, they became relatively successful. They put religious work is separate, political work is separate. Right? al fasl bayna siyasa wa da'wa. Now, Let's turn to Tunisia a little bit. Now, the Tunisian and Nahda was taught by the Egyptian example and threatened by vicious sets of attacks by the opposition. And so they were much more willing to compromise for a variety of reasons. Number one, their mandate was much smaller. They only had 41% in the parliament. The military in Tunisian politics played much smaller roles, so they were actually able to engage in political compromise. Um, that's allowing political process to work itself. 
and their leadership, the leadership of Al-Mahda movement and party in Tunisia, the Islamic Islamist party, was much wiser, especially Rashid al who is the leader of the movement. In some ways, the fact that Al-Mahda did not have much grassroots presence served as a cautionary sign and prevented the party from acting in a cocky manner. So what happened was that because under Zayn al-Abidin bin Ali in Tunisia, they were simply not allowed to have any kind of work. And Nahda ended up with having no grassroots activities, unlike the Muslim brothers. So when they came to power in Tunisia, yes, they had 41% in parliament. But what does that really mean? It means you don't even have a majority. You don't control the police. You don't control the military. You don't control the finance system. And you don't have foot soldiers. In other words, your, your position is extremely weak. The Brotherhood, on the other hand, had the majority in parliament. They had a lot of foot soldiers that enabled them to be bold and, and, and sometimes exclusionary. And they felt that, you know, they had society and politics in their hands. We know that wasn't true, but that was their perception. I think uh, among the movement and party in Tunisia should be given tremendous credit for preserving democratic process and securing a new set of monitored elections that will happen later this year while preserving themselves at the same time. The opposition in Tunisia, and I was there in early October when there was really a tough time for Nanda, and the opposition was basically invoking and, and, and openly desiring the Egyptian scenario to repeat itself in Tunisia. Uh, and it, had that taken place, I think Tunisian fledgling democracy would have been set back many years, if not decades. So I think it's to great credit to Rashid al Ghanoushi and Nahda that they really persisted on finding a political compromise and a political solution to the crisis that the country was in and paying away for a new set of elections that will happen in Tunisia later this year and, and hopefully save this fledgling Tunisian democracy. Uh, and, and, and their actions are really radically different from what we've seen in Egypt by the Muslim brothers. So, if we look at that, at all this, and, and there is much more to be said about what took place in many of these countries, but for the sake of time, we can't really engage in every minor detail. I hope that during the Q&A, some of these will come out, because I'm sure most of you are waiting for the Q&A to ask what you're interested in. Um, how much time do I have all together for this? Um, seven. What's that? Up to seven. No, but I'm not going to speak until seven. But I mean for the lecture. It's up to you. It's up to me. Okay, when I start seeing people falling asleep, I'll stop. Um, so what is the road forward for political Islamists? Where do they go from? Where do they go to from now? I think in spite of all that's happened and in spite of the challenges that the Islamists are facing, uh, if I put my political lenses, I would say that the uprisings have created new openings, not only in terms of political opportunity, which was there for the Islamists, and they still continue to seizing that opportunity in some countries, but also with regard to developing new venues in Islamic political thought all of which are being hinted at or written about by the Islamists. So what I'm going to spend the last portion of this lecture on is talk about four venues or four areas in Islamic political thought that I think have become very apparent in light of these uprisings and uh, may become in some way suggestive of where the future of political Islam is going to go. These four notions, our four venues are, number one, the changing notion of political obedience. The changing notion of political obedience, atara in Arabic. Number two, the Salafis' entrance into politics. I'm going to explain each of these. The Salafis' entrance into politics. Number three, rise of parliamentary politics. Rise of parliamentary politics. And number four, entrance of what is called the discourse on maqasid al-sharia, that is to say, higher objectives of Islamic law into politics and policy. And I'm going to explain all of this. So, so we have this discourse on higher objectives of Islamic law becoming part of politics and policy. 
So let me explain each of these. Because these four became apparent during these uprisings and after. And even though the work of the political Islamists has now become different to some countries like Egypt and Syria, I think what's been happening since then is really opening these new venues and new ways of thinking about Islamic political thought. So the first one is, I think one of the things that the, uh, the Arab uprisings have produced is a shift from emphasis on unconditional obedience that is owed to the government or the ruler to a conditional obedience predicated on the ruler's good governance and abiding by the rule of law. Political obedience rests on the issue of legitimacy. That is to say, when does the ruler or the government command obedience among the rule or the government? And conversely, when is such obedience not due? Uh, for, for, for some of you, you may invoke from, of course, the, the American Declaration of Independence, you know, that the, uh, the, the, the consent of the government, that the rightful government is the one that is based on the consent of the people. Uh, Sunni political thought, if you look historically, expanded over time to give legitimacy to even such rulers who came to power via the military coup, or whose inauguration is confirmed by only one person from those who can actually accept their, uh, you know, their, their inauguration, the people that are called Ahlul Hadli Wa'akt, those who lose and bind who have the power to appoint the ruler. On the other hand, poor governance, the ruler's personal indiscretions, and even tyrannical rule were usually not seen as reasons not to obey the ruler. So even if it's tyrannical, in classical Sunni political thought, you have to obey the ruler. Why? Because if you do not, you're going to create a revolution. Revolution is going to lead into chaos. A lot of people are going to get killed. It's better to live under tyranny than to live under chaos. That was a classical thinking. Um, and I'm sure Professor Ketchum is enjoying this part because this is uh, really at the core of what we used to discuss in, in his class. Um, so obedience to the ruler has always been a centerpiece of the classical Sunni political theory. Faced with a civil war which happened during the early decades of Islamic history, Sunni political theory developed a strong distaste for rebellion and uprising against the standing rulers. Many prophetic traditions seem to indicate that tolerating the ruler's excesses is part and parcel of political reality. This Hobbesian dilemma, that is to say, choosing between chaos on the one hand, and often a paramount ruler who ensures instability and order on the other, was thus answered in Sunni political experience by siding with the ruler who provides order and stability, even if he was oppressive and lacking in virtue. And if you think, when the military coup happened in Egypt, the most recent one, um, when Philip Marshall now, well not now, he is a bicycle rider, I think, a CC. Abdul Fattah Sisi, he was riding a bicycle through Cairo the other day, I think, in a tracksuit. I guess that is his new, that is his new vocation. Um, when he came to announce the military coup, which of course wasn't called the coup, but it, it was by any definition of political science, it was a military coup. Um, he was flanked on both sides by Sheikh al and the leader of the Coptic Church. What does that mean? This is very classical notion. You have a military ruler taking over the government, and you have religious, you know, dignitaries bestowing legitimacy on what he is doing. That's a that's a prototypical classical Sunni position, if you will. Right? It's very interesting. Um, now, if you look at a history of, of Sunni political thought. This thing was not without tensions. There was always another aspect of Sunni political thought which emphasized the importance of justice and virtue. Ibn Taymiyyah famously stated that God supports just ruler even if he is a non-Muslim and brings down an unjust ruler even if he is a Muslim. 
Also, the prophetic tradition affirmed that there is no obedience to any creature in what constitutes disobedience to the Creator. But the classical Sunni thought was decisively in favor of the former trend of relatively unconditional obedience to the ruler. The emerging post-Arab uprisings discourse sways the pendulum toward the latter. That is to say, the one that says emphasizes justice and virtue. The classical notion of avoiding rebellion, khuruj al-imam, in Arabic sedition, fitna, in order to avoid destruction and chaos, facade, had been turned upside down by stating that destruction and chaos caused by dictatorship is greater than any chaos that could be produced by rebellion. Now, of course, if you look at the Syrian situation, you might also think that maybe those classical Sunni theorists are really onto something, right? That their fears of a possibility of a civil war as a result of a rebellion against the ruler could really result in, 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 in adverse circumstances. So if you look at Syrian case, you would say, well, they are kind of exonerated, almost justified. Because you know what? Bashar al-Assad is a really bad, bad ruler. Uh, he's a dictator. But do you prefer that over what's happening in Syria right now? Millions of refugees, hundreds of thousands of killed, destruction of all cities in Syria, complete displacement of millions of people. Which one is, which one is better? And classical Sunni political theorists said, neither is good, but the first one is definitely much better. So they were political realists. They didn't think ideally about the world, they thought realistically. They didn't think about the best possible world out there. They thought about the best world under the circumstances you were in. Very interesting. So if you look at what happened early in the Egyptian uprising, of course, Ali Juma suggested in the, the, um, the Grand Mufti, not Sheikh Alasma, right? He's a Grand Mufti. Uh, suggested that Mubarak was a legitimate leader. So when people start rebelling against Hosni Mubarak, this was early in, in, in the rebellion against him. Ali Juma, Grand Mufti of Al Azhar University, you know, the great seat of learning among the Sunni Muslims, said, well, this rebellion should not take place. But a lot of people rebuked Ali Juma and said, well, why not? Actually, the dictatorship that he's been running for 30 years has caused more misery to people of Egypt than any rebellion can do. So it, they, they kind of turned the argument upside down. So what you have now, people are using things like conditional loyalty, legitimate right to protest and dissent, uh, demanding justice and accountability. But of course, then you have situation in Egypt post coup and, and the situation is um, as dictatorial as you can imagine. So that much here to be said about this notion of political legitimacy and authority and obedience. And I've just opened that up. But I think in the minds of many people, including non-Islamists, I think the notion of legitimacy cannot rest anymore on those classical notions, traditional notions. It has to be tied to the consent of the people. It has to be tied to good governance and the rule of law. And any government that does not apply any of these is not a legitimate government. So even though these reactionary forces are still, you know, pushing back. I think over time, the can that was opened by, the, by these latest uprisings are going to lead in the direction of more and more people accepting this kind of view that is rooted more in justice and values and conditionality and and um, and, and um, right to protest and dissent, which now again has been completely abolished in places like Egypt. So that is about that. I want to also mention a few things about the Salafis. Uh, now, does everybody know when we mention the word Salafi, what do we mean? Uh, who doesn't? So the Salafis are this uh, kind of even conservative group among the Muslims who basically say that in order to be a proper Muslim, you have to go all the way back to the generation of the Prophet and the early Muslims, his companions and disciples and so on, and, um, and that what happened in later Islamic history really had very little to do with Islam. 
So in order to recover the true spirit of Islam, you have to go to the beginning, not only in terms of ideas, but also in terms of behavior, so that you would find the Salafis emulating what they believe is a proper prophetic behavior with long beards and, and, and white gowns and so on and so forth. They are distinctive in their, in their appearance even. Um, for a long time, the Salafis were really quietest when it came to politics. They stayed away from it. They said that politics is really bad, that their work is religious work, has nothing to do with politics, and that especially any kind of democratic politics is tantamount to committing kufr or disbelief against God. The democracy is totally opposed to Islam. Elections, parliament, all of these things are not only un-Islamic, they are anti-Islamic. Muslims should stay away from that. And so it was very interesting to see that in places like Egypt, but also in other places in Libya, even in Tunisia, though they are very small, um, the Salafis, after the uprisings, entered into politics. So imagine what kind of shift this is. One day you are saying anyone who enters into electoral politics is basically committing an act of disbelief. He's not a Muslim anymore. And then on the other, you have these people now entering politics, forming their political party, running a candidate for presidency, and all of these things, right? That's a, that's a remarkable shift. I think you would agree with me. Uh, the immediate reaction of the Salafis when the uprisings began in Egypt was to, was a, actually a rare agreement with the al azhar affiliated scholars, Shriuch, where they say that, you know, this rebellion is illegitimate and Muslims should not join this rebellion. But then after witnessing the power of the people, they started changing their notion. They formed not one, but several political parties. Anyone who knows Egypt would know that Salafis in Egypt are also not monolithic. You have uh, Alexandrian school, you have Cairo school, uh, you have the Medhavis, you have all of these different Salafi groups. And different groups among them formed different political parties, the largest of which was called Ennua the light party. But there's also al Asala and many others. Um, with the Salafis' entrance into politics, their acceptance of democratic politics. But again, there is no doubt that this was, number one, a new development, and number two, one that could possibly have very interesting repercussions. Just think of the countries where the Salafis are most um, prevalent. And that would be the Gulf countries. The Saudis, the Kuwaitis, in Kuwait the Salafis are in politics, they do have something that resembles parliament. But Qatar and all these countries, just imagine if the Salafis in all these countries decide to be political. That would create tremendous change, especially in Saudi Arabia. Because so far the Salafis in Saudi Arabia have basically stayed away from politics. If they decide to enter politics, then Saudi Arabia is going to change politically. To what, I do not know. And, and, and in order to prevent that from happening, of course, the Saudis collaborated with the Egyptian Salafis to bring down the Muslim Brothers and then proclaim Muslim Brothers as a terrorist group in Saudi Arabia, um, not allowing them. And, and really, it wasn't about the Muslim Brothers, it was about the Salafis, because they were afraid that this is going to spread to Salafis in Saudi Arabia, where they are really numerous. Let me say a couple more things before I conclude. One thing that also was interesting, if you look at the political program of many of these Islamic political parties that emerged after the uprisings, they state in their political programs that the parliamentary politics and the parliamentary government is the desired form of government. So I'll read to you, for instance, from the Freedom and Justice Party, which was the Muslim Brothers political party in Egypt. It says, and I'm quoting here, our program deems the parliamentary system in the long term is the most appropriate to the circumstances of the country as it is based on flexible separation between the authorities with cooperation and balance between the executive and legislative branches. So the Muslim brothers are speaking language of well, Jeffersonian democracy in a way, you have separation of powers, you have uh, separate branches, you have a parliament, and this was
is extremely interesting. Uh, and Mahda in Tunisia said the same, and many other political parties said the same. Now, this is in stark contrast with the classical Sunni political thought, because in classical Sunni political thought, you had the leader, you had the imam, you had the khalifa, the caliph, you had the paramount ruler. We don't talk about the parliament, right? And so all of a sudden now, the parliamentary system of government becomes the most desired form of government. This, I argue, is, uh, again, another distance of departure from classical thought. It would have been interesting had the Egyptian parliament survived and continued to see what was going to happen out of it. But I think, again, the cat is out of the bag, so as, as they say. In other words, I think this notion that you do have, to, you need to have parliament, you need to have a consultative body, uh, you can't depend on a strong president because the experience of Arab countries in the last 80 years with strong presidents is, of course, disastrous. Uh, is, is a moving new direction. But of course, there is a lack of parliamentary culture in all of these countries. And so when people have known strong presidents for a long time, when you advocate parliamentary politics, it doesn't resonate because people really doesn't know what it means. So it takes time to develop, but of course it was halted in its tracks, as it were, and, um, and we don't know what's going to happen. Finally, I will say a few things about higher objectives of Islamic law, what is known as Makasid al-Sharia. And this is an approach in Islamic jurisprudence which emphasizes higher objectives and general principles over specific rulings and regulations. In other words, it says that Islamic law is really about some higher set of principles and values. And these are really the objectives of Islamic law. In the past, these objectives were reached through specific set of rulings in Islamic jurisprudence known as fiqh and so on. But as time has changed, we need to change specific rulings in order to satisfy those permanent universal objectives and principles. This, for a long time, has been known in the field of fiqh and the soul of fiqh, that is to say, principles of Islamic jurisprudence. But what we've seen since the Arab uprisings is that this jurisprudential discourse is entering now into political discourse. So you find these political actors in Egypt and Tunisia talking about, well, we don't want to introduce the Sharia. We don't want to go into the books of jurisprudence and pick specific rulings and apply them to today. What we want is, we want to apply Islamic principles of Islamic law. So this is a clear indication of this Matasidi discourse, discourse that is based on higher objectives, entering into political discourse. I'll read to you again from the program of the Freedom and Justice Party of the Muslim Brothers. It says, the following, and I'm quoting. The ultimate, the ultimate objectives, maqasid, of sharia, let us say the Islamic law, which aims to achieve the basic necessities, then the essential needs, and then the accessory or more improved requirements, for those who understand that, represent the overarching policy in setting the prioritization of objectives, policies, and strategies. In other words, they are saying, we're not going to use specific Islamic laws to govern. What we're going to, to do is use these overarching principles in order to set priorities for our governments. And this, again, is something new. Prior to these uprisings, no one, nobody used this kind of language in political discourse. So this is another door that's been opened by this. So four things, as I said, obedience, parliamentary politics, the Salafis entry into politics, and these higher objectives of Islamic law, I think are all new venues that have been opened by the uprisings, and I think a lot of thinking, a lot of theorizing, and probably some of practice in future is going to go along with these four lines of inquiry that have been opened by the uprisings. In conclusion, if you look at Turkish political Islam, since you know the title is political Islam, and while, we've, while it was after the Arab uprisings, 
and focusing primarily on the Arab countries, it is good now, in conclusion, to do some comparative analysis. Turkish political Islam adapted and evolved after Nejmetin Erbakan's Refa party was banned in 1990. Was it six? Six or seven? When was it banned? 1997. Seven. Okay. And so what they did, they separated religious work from political work. They went through a few parties like Fazilet and what was the other party until they finally came to AKP and and, and that took its, um, its, its, its own course. Um, so evolution of Islam, of Islamist discourse is something that is real. They are not, um, they are not rooted in one experience. Uh, they are subject to change. And even the Muslim Brothers experience shows that. There was a very good article published some time ago in the International Journal of Middle East Studies called The Metamorphosis of the Muslim Brothers. Maybe some of you have seen it, by Mona Al-Babashi. And she writes there, she shows how in the 80s and the 90s the Muslim Brothers discourse went through tremendous evolution and change. So unlike these assertions that we often hear that political Islamists are uh, really going back in time and, and really are recycling all ideas, they have proven to actually be savvy in developing and evolving their ideas over time. Turkey is an example, the Muslim Brothers is an example. And so I think in, in spite of the challenges that many of them are facing right now in the Middle East, they will continue evolving with their ideas. And I've indicated some possibilities with that. If we look at Malaysia and Indonesia, two Muslim majority countries that have had a strong Islamic party presence, in case of Malaysia, more than 60 years now. In case of Indonesia, since the Reformasi movement, reform movement of 1998. The evidence from these two countries suggests that political Islam loses its appeal and uniqueness once political space is opened and pluralized. When you have many political parties vying for power, people start realizing that maybe political Islamists aren't as unique as they say that they are. Um, in most recent elections in these two countries, last year in Malaysia and a week ago in Indonesia, Islamic political parties gained very small share of votes, higher in Indonesia than in Malaysia. But the most successful Islamic political party in Indonesia gained about 9.5% last week. So all major political, and Indonesia have many Islamic political parties, just like you had in Egypt after the uprisings. Major Islamic political parties in Indonesia combined last week got about 25% of the vote. So 75% of the vote went to nationalist, more secular political parties. And when I say nationalist, it doesn't mean that actually in Indonesia, just like in Egypt, political space has become Islamized, if you want to put it that way. In other words, even nationalist political parties have to, in some way, claim that they are supporting and upholding Muslim identity. They can't go openly against Islam. But they are really not going for Islamic State or the kind of things that political Islam is something to enforce. It seems that the way to go then is openness and inclusiveness. I think if Middle Eastern countries were to open their political space, become more inclusive, over time a political Islam will lose much of its appeal. Whether that is good or bad depends on where you stand on these things. But, um, but I think that's what evidence suggests. And I think even in a country in which you have pseudo-Islamic political party like Turkey, um, I mean, how long can Erdogan sustain 45%? It, it simply can't. If you look at history of Turkey, no party up until emergence of AKP ever won more than 31%, I think, was the highest ever poll by one party. I'm talking about post-1950, not talking about the after time. But that was different. But you know, when you pluralize the space, I think no party ever won more than 31% until AKP. So 25% that Erdogan has, I don't think it's sustainable in the long run. It's just, it's just not going to happen. It's just nature of politics. And so what this means for Islamic parties in the tumultuous Middle East remains 
to be seen. Well, with these remarks, I close my rather long lecture. I hope I didn't bore you too much, and I thank you for your attention. And I think we have quite a plenty of time for Q&A right now. Thank you. So should I just be the moderator at the same time and just say, OK, go ahead and ask questions? Yes. Yes. I just sort of uh, comment that you said that there is no room for revolution in the classical Islamic thought. I don't so think that, political. yeah, uh, I don't think that is true when it says that, if I'm right, uh, my reading is correct, and memory is correct, is that so long as you can have a complete displacement or replacement of the ruler, without much bloodshed, you can have a peaceful revolution. I'm not familiar with any text that says that, but um, but the, the usual rebuttal would come immediately and say, well, there's no way you can have that without, except in the case of military coup, which did happen frequently in Muslim history, which, speaking from the point of view of, of basic legitimacy, both well, Sunni and Shia political thought would be illegitimate, but was usually illegitimized post facto. That is to say, after it happened, people would say, well, these people are now in power. They have the guns. OK, let's call them the rightful rulers. Um, so if that kind of revolution, yeah. But it's usually legitimized post facto, not before. And so, um, yeah, in theory, you could have a good government coming to power. But really, that was never core of the concern for some political theorists. It was about ensuring stability. It was about preventing chaos. It was about ensuring that the ruler abided by at least the minimum of uh, provisions. And that would be that, of course, he had to be a Muslim. And he had to at least publicly say that he's upholding, upholding Islamic law. As long as he said those two things and did a few things to symbolically engage in that, they were ready to overlook many, many of so, um, so yeah. That's, that's Other questions, comments? Since I know quite a few of you, I'm going to start calling names. <laughs> you know, calling on you if, if you don't ask. So, um, yes. Uh, when you talked about uh, obedience and uh, the people will not be obedient to the ruler anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, that could be true, actually, for, I would say, the non, the, one of the fundamentals, as you know, one of the fundamentals of the Muslim brothers is hearing and obeying, some or Sure. That, I don't think this changed. No. I don't think this changed with whatever happened lately. So they still continue on the model that they are right, and they have to continue on this, although the rest of the people, yes, they woke, they woke up, actually, and this is not going to continue anymore. So that would be a problem for them if and when they come back. Yeah, I mean, they definitely had a mismatch between their internal organization and the way how they treated their own internal organization and, and, and the public discourse on politics. Where in public discourse, they would say, you have popular elections and you know people are governing and so on. Uh, internally, they were still very, very authoritarian. Uh, the way they would elect their uh, Murshid al -Aram, the supreme or the general guy, the way that they would be required to uh, fall in line and toe the line, uh, it's actually quite similar to his movement. You know, I thought I must have been on the toes here, but, uh, but since we're speaking comparatively, uh, of course, in his movement, you don't even have an election for it. You, you know, it's one person is there and that's it. And in the Muslim right, they would have some sort of election of the of the of Murshid al -Aram. But once he is in place, yeah, you give him that traditional, unconditional uh, hearing and obeying, so to say. But in political discourse, they would say that people have the right to choose and openness and pluralism. And that's, I think, what hurt a lot of Egyptians. They would say, well, how can a an organization that is basically authoritarian within its own organization and institutions govern country in a democratic way. 
there's simply no way you can hack that. That was what created a lot of, I think, um, a lot of dislike for the Muslim brothers among the Egyptians post-revolution. Yeah. Um, others, Professor. When you talk about the the fourth of principles of attention to a to the higher general principles of Islam. And then, and then you really, in many other ways, say that the, the only way that notion projects to the present is by recognizing that practically all of the things that Muslims have tried politically doesn't work very well. The, the uh, Salafis don't like anything since the time of the prophets. Uh, are, are, are you saying really that uh, uh, is a way Islamic thought, which is recognizing that in the present uh, there isn't much applicable <laughs> Islamic thought, and that are they looking for something else, and is this likely to be some kind of uh, Islamic version of uh, self-rule or something? Where is it headed? Yeah. Well, where is it headed is, of course, hard to tell. We can only kind of glance through the window or through the door, but we can't really see what's inside. But I think uh, countries like Malaysia, for instance, they've been putting a lot of effort in trying to utilize uh, these higher objectives of Islamic law in their own policy. Uh, this needs to be said because uh, we often focus too much on the Middle East, forgetting that very important developments are taking place in Malaysia and Indonesia probably two most dynamic Muslim countries in addition to Turkey. Uh, but in Turkey it's different because you can't openly still bring these things into, into public discourse, whereas in Malaysia and Indonesia you can. Even by non-Islamic political parties they bring these things into public discourse. And so they have these new developments that are saying, look, what would it mean if we apply general principles and objectives of Islamic law? We do not look at specific laws that, you know, scholars of the past have pronounced when it comes to Islamic jurisprudence. And then apply that to politics, to law, to policies, and all of these other things. I'm sure you're familiar in Malaysia with this notion of harmonization. So Malaysia, because of its colonial past and post-colonial present, has basically dual legal system. They have inherited the British common civil law and criminal law. And they also inherit a traditional Islamic law that, that applies to personal matters, uh, marriage, divorce, inheritance, and so on. So there is a dual legal system in Malaysia. So what they're saying is, look, this dual legal system often creates controversy. It creates disharmony. How can we harmonize these two? So they look at, at laws and everything. They said, well, 85% of laws do not need to be harmonized because 85% of laws that come from the British system are very similar to laws that come from the Islamic system. It is only about 15% that you need to really look hard and find the ways how to, to work it out. So once you start looking from that perspective, you will find that actually there isn't that much radical difference between the two. And that could lead into a new appreciation of civil law and common law. That could lead into new ways of thinking about different possibilities. Uh, some people could, would say that it leads to secularization of Islamic law. And that's an interesting topic to be discussed. But at the same time, people do not, I think, realize that what was called but traditionally Islamic law in many ways used, was always secular by other definitions. Because classical notions did not really distinguish between the two. So what we would call religious law in classical Islam often covered matters that today we would recognize as very secular aspects of life. And so there is that notion, and, and I think we'll, we'll see some interesting developments. But where it's going to go remains to be seen. I think what, what Muslim countries need is, is, is first and foremost, I think Rashid al Hanushi says that all the time in Tunisia. They need freedom. Because without freedom, you cannot think, you cannot write, you cannot express, you cannot work, you cannot develop, you cannot experiment, you cannot practice. 
And, um, and he says that clearly. He said, I heard, I heard him speaking, he said, a lot of people accuse us, that is to say political Islamists in Tunisia, of compromising too much. And he said, yeah, we compromise because politics is about compromise. But there is one thing that we never wanted to compromise, that we never accept to compromise on. What do you think that thing is? Islamic Sharia? Islamic law? No. It's freedom. Freedom is one thing we will not compromise on. That's one thing we need to preserve. And actually, if you read, and this is interesting, talking about higher objectives of Islamic law and the Sharia, because one of the great popularizers of that was a Tunisian, a modern Tunisian thinker who passed away only three decades ago. His name was Muhammad ibn Ashur. He, he wrote a huge book on, on this issue of Maqasid al-Sharia, or the higher objective of Islamic law. And he said that there are classical Islamic thinkers said there are five primary objectives of Islamic law. To all Islamic laws lead toward preservation of one of five primary objectives. To preserve religion, family, property, uh, mind, and progeny. Even Ashur, a Tunisian, modern Tunisian thinker, came and said these five are okay, but there is one that is missing, and that is freedom. He said Islamic laws, in their essence, seek to protect human freedom. Now that's an interesting thing. And now the six, Rajal Anushin says, this is the one we will not compromise on. Because said religion, you know, Tunisians are Arabs, Muslims, they are secular and this and that, but that's that's not going to be a problem. Family is going to stay, property, all of these things, but freedom is one that really needs taking care of, to be taken care of. Um, so that's that's interesting. So where is that gonna lead? We don't know yet, but it's interesting. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Uh, I don't know how closely you are following the Turkish domestic politics, but currently there is a kind of tension or political struggle going on between between the government and the Smith movement, and kind of the Smith movement is accusing the prime minister of being kind of a corrupt leader, and uh, and also Erdogan is becoming kind of you know that's the case that Erdogan is becoming more and more authoritarian day by day, kind of the government. Put a ban on Twitter and Facebook, uh, YouTube, and this ban kind of was later on lifted by the Constitutional Court. But that's the case that Erdogan is becoming more and more authoritarian. Uh, I think I should get, I should better get my question. What do you think, uh, what do you think about Turkey's political future? You know, on the one hand, you, are, you have a government becoming more and more authoritarian, and you have public demanding for more democratic rights. And then, do you think that? A political, an Islamic political party kind, kind of, you know, can reconcile between those demands? Yeah, um, theoretically speaking, yes. Practically speaking, I think it would be very difficult because the trenches have been dug and people have taken their positions. And, you know, in, in case of Turkey, when you have, um, what is his name, Adnan Okta, Harun Yahya, when you have him trying to intermediate, you know that something's really wrong. You know, like you almost want to, going to intermediate, and you know that it's, it's not going to work, that both sides have said, we don't want to talk to the other side. I just uh, met a, somebody from Turkey a few days ago, and, and who is very familiar with both sides, and said, yeah, there were very serious efforts to mediate between the two, and I'm sure many of you who are from Turkey know that. But maybe both sides said, we are not interested. Thank you very much. So um, when it comes to that, I think Theory takes a back seat and politics has to play itself out. So I, I, I think, it, unfortunately, it may turn out to be ugly. I hope not. I hope not for the sake of Turkey and Turkish people and the region as a whole, but I don't know. It doesn't look good right now. Yeah. Yes. 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 Uh, you mentioned something about freedom and I feel like sometimes we interact with uh, some of our friends on campus in Amusi. That way, we don't always come up to the table. So I would say that you really have to go back to think about the definition of freedom, what we mean about freedom. The 
because personally I feel like uh, when it comes to freedom, Islam gives us freedom. But the thing is, we don't really understand what freedom means. If we go back to one of the hadiths of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that whosoever believe in Allah and the day of judgment, you, you shouldn't bother your neighbors or you shouldn't bother someone. So just even your thoughts or your look, if that will hurt someone, you that mean like you you know a good Muslim. So what kind of freedom is more than this? So I will say that as Muslim or as citizen, it doesn't matter how what is our identity, we should go back to really think, reflect about the word of freedom. No, that's a very good comment. I think that the notion of freedom is still quite underdeveloped in Islamic thought and needs to be, especially in relation to modern life and what it means. It needs to be, I think, um, thought about, rethought. Um, so, so that's a good comment, I and mean, I agree with you. It's, it's really at the essence. I mean, you have one of the big issues, of course, is the issue of apostasy, for instance. Where, where in classical Islamic law, I mean, uh, they, they said that somebody who apostates from Islam, who is a Muslim and then rejects Islam, is to be killed. Right? Um, a lot of uh, Muslim thinkers in contemporary times, including even Fatawa by Al Asar and many others, have said that this kind of thinking is uh, either A, not correct, or B, not applicable in modern times. You know? And they tie that in some ways to a freedom argument. But what does that mean? I think is still relatively underdeveloped in Islamic thought. And, and I think uh, this discourse on higher objective of Islamic law provides an opening and a venue to look into that and to see what it means.